are capable of knowing certainly that there is a God. Though God has given us no innate ideas of himself, though he has stamped no original characters on our minds wherein we may read his being, yet having furnished us with those faculties our minds are endowed with, he hath not left himself without witness, since we have sense, perception, and reason, and cannot want a clear proof of him as long as we carry ourselves about us. Nor can we justly complain of our ignorance in this great point, since he has so plentifully provided us with the means to discover and know him, so far as is necessary to the end of our being, and the great concernment of our happiness. But, though this be the most obvious truth that reason discovers, and though its evidence be, if I mistake not, equal to mathematical certainty, yet it requires thought and attention, and the mind must apply itself to a regular deduction of it from some part of our intuitive knowledge, or else we shall be as uncertain and ignorant of this as of other propositions which are in themselves capable of clear demonstration. To show, therefore, that we are capable of knowing, i.e. being certain that there is a God, and how we may come by this certainty, I think we need go no further than ourselves and that undoubted knowledge we have of our own existence. All the lesser devils seem to have possessed a normal form, which was as hideous and distorted as fancy could render it. To the conception of an angel, imagination has given the only beautiful appendage the human body does not possess, wings. To that of a devil, it has added all those organs of the brute creation that are most hideous or most harmful. Advancing civilization has almost exterminated the belief in a being with horns, cloven hooves, goggle eyes, and scaly tail that was held up to many yet living as the avenger of childish disobedience in their earlier days, together perhaps with some strength of conviction of the moral hideousness of the evil he was intended in a rough way to typify. But this hazily retained impression of the author of evil was the universal and entirely credited conception of the ordinary appearance of those bad spirits who were so real to our ancestors of Elizabethan days. I think it is beyond question that man has a clear idea of his own being. He knows certainly he exists and that he is something. He that can doubt whether he be anything or no, I speak not to, no more than I would argue with pure nothing, or endeavor to convince non-entity that it were something. If anyone pretends to be so skeptical as to deny his own existence, for really to doubt of it is manifestly impossible, let him for me enjoy his beloved happiness of being nothing, until hunger or some other pain convince him of the contrary. This, then, I think, I may take for a truth which every one's certain knowledge assures him of beyond the liberty of doubting, viz. that he is something that actually exists. Some are so carnally minded, says Scott, that a spirit is no sooner spoken of, but they think of a black man with cloven feet, a pair of horns, a tail, and eyes as big as a basin. Scott, however, was one of a very small minority in his opinion as to the carnal mindedness of such a belief. He, in his day, like those in every age and country who dared to hold convictions opposed to the creed of the majority, was a dangerous skeptic. His book was publicly burnt by the common hangman, and not long afterwards a royal author wrote a treatise against the damnable doctrines of two principally in our age, whereof the one, called Scott, an Englishman, is not ashamed in public print to deny that there can be such a thing as witchcraft, and so maintains the old error of the Sadducees in denying of spirits. In the next place, man knows by an intuitive certainty that bare nothing can no more produce any real being than it can be equal to two right angles. If a man knows not that non-entity or the absence of all being cannot be equal to two right angles, 
it is impossible that he should know any demonstration in Euclid. If, therefore, we know there is some real being, and that non-entity cannot produce any real being, it is an evident demonstration that, from eternity, there has been something, since what was not from eternity had a beginning, and what had a beginning must be produced by something else. Spencer has clothed with horror this conception of the appearance of the fiend, just as he has enshrined in beauty the belief in the guardian angel. It is worthy of remark that he describes the devil as dwelling beneath the altar of an idol in a heathen temple. Prince Arthur strikes the image thrice with his sword. And the third time out of a hidden shade, there forth issued from under the altar smoke a dreadful fiend with foul, deformed look that stretched itself as it had long lain still, and her long tail and feathers strongly shook that all the temple did with terror fill, yet him not terrified that feared nothing ill. Again, a man finds in himself perception and knowledge. We have then got one step further, and we are certain now that there is not only some being, but some knowing, intelligent being in the world. There was a time then, when there was no knowing being, and when knowledge began to be, or else there has been also a knowing being from eternity. If it be said there was a time when no being had any knowledge, when that eternal being was void of all understanding, I reply that then it was impossible there should ever have been any knowledge, it being as impossible that things wholly void of knowledge and operating blindly and without any perception should produce a knowing being as it is impossible that a triangle should make itself three angles bigger than two right ones. For it is as repugnant to the idea of senseless matter that it should put into itself sense, perception, and knowledge, as it is repugnant to the idea of a triangle that it should put into itself greater angles than two right ones. And huge, great beast it was, when it in length was stretched forth, that nigh filled all the place, and seemed to be of infinite great strength, horrible, hideous, and of hellish race, born of the brooding of a kingdom base, or other like infernal furies kind, for of a maid she had the outward face, to hide the horror which did lurk behind, the better to beguile whom she so fond did find. There too the body of a dog she had, full of fell raven and fierce greediness, a lion's claws with power and rigor clad, to rend and tear whatso she can oppress, a dragon's tail, whose sting without redress, full deadly wounds whereso it is in pite, an eagle's wings for scope and speediness, that nothing may escape her reaching might, whereto she ever list to make her hardy flight. Thus from the consideration of ourselves, and what we infallibly find in our own constitutions, our reason leads us to the knowledge of this certain and evident truth, that there is an eternal, most powerful, and most knowing being, which, whether any one will please to call God, it matters not. The thing is evident, and from this idea duly considered will easily be deduced all those other attributes which we ought to ascribe to this eternal being. If, nevertheless, any one should be found so senselessly arrogant as to suppose man alone knowing and wise, but yet the product of mere ignorance and chance, and that all the rest of the universe acted only by that blind haphazard, I shall leave him with that very rational and emphatical rebuke of Tully to be considered at his leisure. What can be more sillily arrogant and misbecoming than for a man to think that he has a mind and understanding in him, but yet in all the universe beside there is no such thing? <laughs> 